Welcome to the Empathic Mastery Show. I'm your host, Jennifer Moore, and I'm so glad you're here. This is a place where we talk about what it means to be highly sensitive and empathic, how this impacts all aspects of our lives, and we explore tools, resources, and solutions so we can shift from absorbing all the thoughts, feelings, and energy of the world around us to being beacons for calm, love, and healing. Hey there, I'm so excited to be here with you right now. My friend Nikki Starcat Shields is with me. Nikki is a book midwife. She is also an amazing author of, at this point, how many books, Nikki? Uh, there are five out there in the world, another one coming soon. <laughs> ah, five books out there in the world and another one coming soon. And you guys, if you've ever tried to write a book, you understand what a absolutely amazing thing that is, that Nikki's got five books out in the world. And Nikki and I just happened to be at our writing retreat, which is sort of a semi-annual event due to pandemic. Last time we were all together was back in 2019. And Nikki and I have been just talking about like the interface between creativity and being highly sensitive and empathic and what that relationship is. And right before we jumped on the microphone here, we were starting to talk about something that we both really agree on, which is avoiding exposure to things that are similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and I was like, yes, I totally agree. And, and Nikki pointed out that as empaths, we're just so much more vulnerable to kind of absorbing and mirroring. Like we become chameleons and that can right. happen even with creativity. Yeah. So I really love that Nikki was saying that because I agree completely. And when I was writing Empathic Mastery, I avoided every Every single book or podcast or, you know, uh, like real on Instagram, everything that anybody else was saying about empaths, because I really didn't want what I had to write about to be influenced by that. Yeah, the book that I've just wrapped up the draft of is called The Elements of Creativity. So I avoided, you know, other writings on creativity and even certain authors who I really love. Um, I had bought a book by Starhawk, who's one of my favorites, um, The Empowerment Manual. And it's about consensus with groups and that sort of thing. So it's not even about creativity per se, but I did not pick that up to read yet because I know that her style is already an influence on mine and I don't want to be inadvertently copying her her voice you yes know? and so yes. i'm looking at this through the lens of writing but i think it's probably similar for anything if you're writing jazz songs you don't want to just listen to your favorite jazz musicians because you're going to just you know kind of copy that style exactly well yeah. and thinking about you know the uh the whole thing of george harrison and my sweet lord and he's so fine and the fact that basically he didn't even realize that he was sort of picking up on this rift he is so fine mm -hmm. and that you know we do this and and that's one of the things i mean I, this is another whole sort of tangent which mm -hmm. is that there's no such thing as a creative idea on the planet. It's right. all right. it's all yeah. recycling yeah. it. But there are things we can do to ensure that it's going to come through our channel a lot more purely. Yeah. And if anything, I think that this is actually something that may be a bit of a difference between being highly sensitive, empathic and and prone to absorbing the thoughts, feelings and energy and sensations that are coming from the world around us, as opposed to your non empathic creative, where I've actually heard writers and other people talk about one of the most important things that you can do as a writer is actually read other people's writing. Yeah. And I sort of was like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I read other people's writing? But as we're having this conversation, I'm like, well, of course, in the same way that people who have the boundaries or the separation between themselves and the rest of the world have an ability to kind of witness the world, see it, notice it, make observations, but not necessarily feel it. I think that that's the same with creativity. It's like mm -hmm. when we engage with somebody else's book, when we engage with somebody else's podcast, when we engage with somebody else's music or art, it's such an immersive experience that it really influences the way we then express our own creativity. One thing that has helped me that we can actually do proactively is to flip it around and immerse ourselves in our own work. And I know you've done that. So in other words, like when I'm writing my book on creativity, because I work with clients about creativity, I'm going back and I'm looking at my notes from client 
you know, sessions. I'm going back and looking at my my plans for my group when I'm teaching my group programs or I'm going back to my own journals and seeing what I have written on my own about this. And so it's like immersing yourself in your own voice. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, and I just I think that this idea of the importance of immersing ourselves in our own voice is a message that I think is especially crucial for people who are highly sensitive and empathic. Mm -hmm. And I guess I just want to also make a comment about like, so why empaths and creativity? Why are we even like, so Jen, why are you having this, this podcast about creativity? And what I will say is I know for myself that creativity has been an outlet that has saved my life mm. over and over and over again. And that creativity is also a way to process the information that is coming in and is a way to make sense of things that don't make any sense. Yeah. And then a lot of times when I don't have the ability to articulate things, when I don't have the ability to say, um, oh, this is this is mine. This is not mine. I'm picking this stuff up that's about the war in Ukraine or mm -hmm. about the distress of, you know, you name it, mm -hmm. you know, issue du jour. When I'm at that place where I really can't make sense of it, it's like taking to the page, spending time journaling, taking to the canvas, spending time making art in some, you know, visual painting, drawing. There's a way moving our bodies, dancing, singing, engaging with music, that when we do that, I think there's a way that we can start making sense of it. So yeah. as I'm saying this, I'm just realizing that I really think that there's a way that the creative process really allows us. It's another tool within empathic mastery of recognize because it's a way and it's also another tool of release. Mm -hmm. Like we could probably move through all five of the aspects of empathic mastery with this, because I think that the creative expression and the creative process kind of allows us to navigate our sensitivity. Yeah. And one of the things we were kind of talking about, you know, before we turned on the mic was about having a space of one's own. Yes. Uh, Virginia Woolf wrote about it as a room of one's own. I don't believe that you necessarily have to ho have a whole separate room, but mm -mm. Uh, having a space. But in some senses, creativity itself can be that space for you. Yes. You know, like yes. I'm going to go work on my book or I'm going to go do a painting. Everyone leave me alone. <laughs> you know, then, everybody you know, leave yeah. me alone. Yeah. Well, and you were saying before we jumped on the mic as well about how having it's not just about like the physical space, but it's the time space. Yes. Claiming space for ourselves to be creative and making it a priority, claiming the value yeah. of creativity for ourselves and saying, I need this. And I think that that is one of the things that is so crucial for highly sensitive empathic people is claiming space, claiming time and giving ourselves permission to not be just 24 seven immersed in everybody else's stuff. Right. Even when and maybe especially when we're overwhelmed, it just reminded me of that. It's a spiritual teacher and I don't remember who said it, but, um, you know, when you're everyone should meditate for 20 minutes a day. And when you're stressed out and burned out and busy two hours, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. more, not mm -hmm. less. So, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. And that just reminded <laughs> me of sort of the opposite of it. There was like years ago when JP Sears was first coming out and doing a whole bunch of like, you know, spoof spiritual oh, videos. Yeah. There was the one where he was talking about, you know, that 20 minute meditation. I nailed it in 10. <laughs> <laughs> love it. I love yeah, that yeah. because, yeah. you know, we live in a society that is so focused on productivity and so focused on, you know, immediate, immediate, immediate. Mm -hmm. And and yet it's like sometimes the best thing we can do is claim more space, slow down and just let things happen at the pace they need to happen. Because we're, so we're so tuned outward to what other people are doing or feeling or thinking that we forget that, you know, to be empathic with ourselves, like, yes. what are we really feeling inside that can, that can be important uh, in terms of like, when you're going to do a big creative project, like write a book, is to not engage the people in your life who will be naysayers, like not like my dad. So I love my dad. He's awesome. But he, you know, he's got he's a pessimist or has been in his life. I feel like he's sort of turning that around even, you know, at 82. But um, he he was, you know, he's oh, no, don't do that. That's too much work. Or you can't do that. You don't know how to do that. So when I wrote my first book, I was I didn't even tell him I was writing it until it was done and I could show it to him. And he was very proud of me. But I know from experience he would have said all these dowdy things and that would have like fed into my own, oh, maybe I shouldn't or maybe I can't or how am I going to do this? And 
And so not engaging with those naysayers. Not engaging with those naysayers. And, you know, there's just so much friction that can happen, even if you force yourself to do it. And even if you're just like, I'm going to show them, Mm. there's so much drag that you get from that kind of doubt. Although I have a story to share with you that I don't think I've ever shared on this show (laughs) that was um, just amazing. So many years ago, I was I had a friend who taught fire walking. Ah, mm -hmm. And so it was Easter weekend and I'd signed up to do my very first fire walk. I was terrified. (laughs) I was absolutely terrified. And so I come and I was living at my, I was in graduate school at the time, or actually I think it might've been right before graduate school. Mm -hmm. Come to think of it. doesn't matter. Anyway, I was living at my parents at the time and I was in my like late twenties, early thirties. And I go to my, I go to my, my mom first and I go, wish me luck. I'm going to go fire walk. (laughs) And my mom goes, Jenny, you can do it. I know you can do it. And I know if you, if, if for some reason you get a feeling that you shouldn't be doing it, I know that you can trust yourself and you'll know exactly what's right. And you're just going to be fine. Just go Mm -hmm. and do it. You're going to be great. (laughs) Just go do it. And so then I come downstairs into the kitchen and my dad was like dealing with the dishes or something. And I say to him, I go, wish me luck. I'm going to go fire walk. And my father just sort of turns around from the from the <laughs> sink and he looks at me and he goes, Jenny, you can't do that. <laughs> And I turn around and I look at him. I go, oh, yeah, watch me. Yeah. And I turned. I just pivoted on my heel and I turn around and I just walk out the door and I get down the stairs and I get in my car. And I was so scared and so anxious that I I I backed my station wagon. Oh. Actually, I think it was. Yeah. Anyway, I backed my car into the back step of our of our <laughs> stoop oh, no. because I was so oh, anxious. So I ended up it was a it was a um it was a cement thing so it didn't get it didn't suffer but my bumper did you know and but what was fascinating about it was it was so telling because I was like on one hand I have this mother who's like you can do yeah, anything yeah. and I have this father who's like you can't no, do anything don't do, don't do it, it. Yeah. it's too scary but the thing that was really amazing was when I came home after I had fire walked, I have these two, I have these two teeny little blisters on the bottom of both of on the soles of my feet, kind of mm-hmm. like right on where the chakras are of mm-hmm. your of your feet. Mm-hmm. I had these two little tiny bl- bl- blisters on my feet. That was all I had. And I came home and I showed my blisters to my dad and my dad was absolutely floored. And he and I was like, look, I did it. And, and he was going like, wrong because my father was somebody who was not particularly articulate especially when we were younger. He actually got more articulate as he got older. But my father was not very articulate. And so I was like, look, I need you to acknowledge this. I just fire walked. Like, come on, say something about this. And and at that point, he's like, Jenny, I'm absolutely amazed. But the thing that was incredible about this was that, you know, with my dad, very often he would not say things directly to us, but I would hear stories about myself uh, from other yeah, people yeah. later. And so what I learned was that my father used the example of me firewalking as a mind over matter thing for years. Uh, he was working in hospice at the time and working for the VNA. And so he was like around people who were like going through just hell and a lot of people like really going through you know, just like incredible discomfort. Mm -hmm. And he would talk about how his daughter could fire walk. And he was like, if she can fire walk, you can do this. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think it's interesting with the naysayers. Sometimes I actually think the naysayers need to see us do it even more than the regular folk. And, you know, with my dad, there has been like, he will always or would always you know, now that he's on the other side, he's much better on the other from the other <laughs> side, actually. But when he was, you know, when he was when he was here, stateside or earthside, he he so frequently would let his fear would run the show yeah. and his fear would and his sense of limitation would run it. But again and again and again, I would he was my biggest cheerleader to other people yeah. and he would brag about things. So yeah. he was really proud once it got done. He just projected so much doubt yeah. and he was a remarkable photographer. He was actually a really, really gifted photographer. I have two of his old Leicas 
And, um, you know, he did really, really beautiful work, but he did not go the path of the artist. Yeah. He went into human services. So I think, you know, he sort of adopted this idea and this message of like, you can't make it as an artist. Mm. And yet, I mean, ironically, that side of the family, there's like, there's tons of us who are artists, writers, I, artists, creators. I think our dads sound quite similar. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter is, uh, does uh, fire spinning. And my dad for years was a volunteer fireman. So oh, playing wow. with fire is not a thing that you do, it's right? It's not so a thing you do. He won't yeah. watch her. He won't watch the whole family be out, in, you know, at some event. And she'll, it'll, she's going to fire spin. And she's amazing. And she's practiced and she's careful and all the things. And he won't watch it because he just can't. But same thing. He'll brag about his granddaughter. You know, like, he, like yeah, he yeah. understands the value of it. It's just like he can't get past that that belief. And that sort of reminds me of, you know, we were started to talk a little bit um, about our childhoods and how our creativity yes. was nurtured or not nurtured. Yes. So um, do you want me to talk about? My yeah, you talk about so, yours. And yeah, um, I came into this world. I feel like I came in from a past life as some kind of scholar or writer or because I was very attuned to the written word and stories and books. And yes, my mom read to me from a young age, which, you know, they say that that really helps. And I did that with my kids, but neither of them are writers. Like I was definitely like I came in, wanted to to be a writer and was told, of course, this was back, you know, I was born in 1969. So, you know, when I was in school as a young kid, it was like, oh, you can't make a living as a writer. You know, you can't do that. You have to have do something that's going to, you know, especially as you got older and you were told these things. And I also, as an empath, could see what pleased people people and I was I was a smart kid so I was like academics were pretty easy like that was like oh I can do that and they you know do this homework get a hundred da, da, da. you know people are pleased they're they, they're glad you know oh you got an A good job you know and so I went that direction and so instead of tuning into what my voice or my creativity was saying I tuned in more I think because of the empathy to the right answers or the answers they wanted to hear. And within that framework, you can get a little creative. I mean, I was in advanced placement English and things like this, where they wanted you to kind of have some mm -hmm. creativity. Mm -hmm. It was like creativity in a box. Absolutely. You know, you, like you get to choose which author you're going to write about. Right. You get to choose, you know, what angle. Like I often took a feminist angle because my mom was feminist. And that was like, and the teacher that I had in AP English was a young woman who So it's like, you know, even in that, you know, I'm choosing this, but I know it's going to please her. I know it's going to, you know. So my creativity was extremely boxed, extremely boxed in for a long time. And it took me a while to unpack that and to find that voice of my own and what I care about and what I want to write about and how I want to combine varying interests in my life. You know, I say I'm a book midwife. I'm a writing coach, um, but I, I weave my own magic and my own uh, stories and my myths and my enchantments and the things that I love into that mm -hmm. now. But as a young woman, like I was very, you know, how you're sort of taught to write generically in college. Like I was very generic and I can spell everything right and I can use the grammar correctly, but it sounds like anybody, you know, it could be anybody. I, right. It could so be I had absolutely to unlearn anybody. unlearn that as right, an adult. Right. And that's, so that was my experience with creativity. Well, and I, it wasn't on purpose. Nobody like set out to like squash me and say, you need to get in the box. It was more of just, oh, this pleases people. It, I'll go with that. It well, feels and, good. And it is it also good. you get rewarded you know. for staying in the box and mm -hmm. you do not get rewarded for staying outside of the box. And mm -hmm. I had, you know, you and I were talking about this. I was really in many ways, I was really, really lucky because I had a very I had a lot of skill, talent as a visual artist from mm -hmm. a very early age. And it was really nurtured. And both of my parents supported that. Mm -hmm. And so I got to take art classes. I got to do everything extracurricular. Like, I mean, I would stay after school in the art room all the time. And I got that validation. But I also come from a family, a long line of people who have dyslexia and mm -hmm. who have like who who have certain levels of neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. And so ADD runs in my family. And so for me, there was a way in which I could not fit into the box and be a straight A student. I was the other kind of kid where it was like I was clearly very, very intelligent and smart, 
but I was constantly, they were constantly saying things like, oh, she's so smart. If only she would apply herself. Right. Because the in my, you said, I had so much, so much potential. She has so much potential. <laughs> and the thing was for me, it was that I was really good at what I was really good at, but I really could not wrap my brain around or force myself to be good at the things that I wasn't good at. Mm -hmm. Like my brain just did not accommodate that. Mm -hmm. So what I experienced was actually when it came to writing papers, especially even in like graduate school, what I discovered, and it was actually, it, was, it wasn't until I got into graduate school that I learned, I cracked the code and I learned you write to the teacher. Mm -hmm. Like I had been trying uh, to write creatively and write from uh, my perspective. Right. And I was constantly getting teachers going, huh? like, no, you're missing the point. You're not regurgitating <laughs> right. what we want you to regurgitate. And it was only when I was in graduate school that I started to realize realize, oh, I need to understand what the teacher wants me to write. And then I can write to what they're asking for. And I'll get a I'll get a really good grade. Uh, yeah, um, and yeah. I sort of I was old enough, like I had I had kind of like, worked through enough of my sort of neurodiversity mm -hmm. that I was able to kind of like manage my mind and manage my dyslexia and manage my writing so that I could kind of navigate it better. But it's, it's really, and the price I paid for that was that when I got out of art school as an undergraduate, I could not make art for a year. Um, I could not wow. make any art for a year. Wow. I was so, my creativity had gotten so squashed yeah. and so like smushed into a box and with so many like shoulds and expectations that I literally, like my creativity was just gone for mm -hmm. a year. Mm -hmm. And I had to surrender. I just had to be like, okay, like I started reintroducing creativity to myself with a box of Crayola crayons and a children's sketch pad. Uh, and for about yeah. a year, I just doodled every day and just made mandalas and did little bits of pretty things because I had, I had lost so much of the joy. And when I was in graduate school, after spending three years writing and regurgitating and writing in the voice that these people wanted me to write in, because what I discovered was if I wrote in my own voice, they didn't love it. Yeah. Two things happened. One was that I developed really bad carpal tunnel while I was in graduate school, because not only was I having to respond to or write to the teachers, I was also in the oldest Protestant seminary in the country. And I was a non-Christian, mm -hmm. but I was surrounded by people who had an extremely constrained view of the world mm -hmm. that the filter, the lens, that their perspective was basically the only real truth was Christianity. Uh, the only way to see the world was through the lens of Christianity and that you could maybe like you could take like psychology or other things and kind of feed them into this lens. Right. But their paradigm was that their their truth was the They're one right. <laughs> they were right. they were right. Yeah. So wow. what happened for me was that as I was writing and as I was working with them so often I felt like I was constantly having to translate my magical numinous understanding of the world like this really kind of like universalized faith I was constantly having to translate it into words and language that met that could meet or accommodate the needs of people who did not understand my language mm -hmm. so I spent three years extruding like were like so much spirit from me through my hands. And it just felt like I was just mm. squeezing concrete through my fingers all the time. And I ended up developing carpal tunnel. And after three years of writing upwards of like, you know, like two to five papers a week, mm -hmm. every single week for three years in graduate school, uh, writing reading, I couldn't do mm -hmm. either. Yeah. I, I could go towards a magazine. Mm -hmm. You know, I could look at I could read an article in a magazine, I could read like, you know, at that point, social media wasn't really mm -hmm. wasn't really a thing yet. So it yeah. wasn't like I'd read memes. But yeah. like, that was what that I was able to do. Yeah. 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 Well, I know you have a lot of listeners who are parents, and especially yes. parents of little kids. So I just want to say, I know I, I have two kids, they're grown now, but um, we we chose to homeschool uh, them and one of the priorities was because of my own experience is letting them have their free flow of creativity whatever that looked like whether that you know whatever it looked like the product is not 
the thing. I don't I'm not looking for some cute thing to hang on my refrigerator. I want you to play with, you know, colored pencils or do whatever you want to do. Um, and, and so that's so important not to squash that creativity. And we don't do it out of meanness. And we don't we do it out of often expediency because parenting is very hard and you want them to sort of fall in line at least enough to like get to bed or whatever, whatever the thing is. But if try so hard, it's such a fleeting part of life. It's such a short time that they're little kids to try so hard to let them have as much freedom of creativity as possible Absolutely. within the admittedly, you know, necessary constraints of, you know, life and safety and people having to eat and all that, you know, but let them have as much as they can. And it will make a huge difference. Huge difference. Well, yeah. And like last night you were commenting about like, or was it earlier today about just like, you know, vacations with children may be fun, but they're not restful, yeah. Yeah. you yeah. know, and just yeah. like there is a just a, there is a cycle of life where with kids, it's like if we allow their creativity to flourish, chances are it's going to be a little bit exhausting and yeah. it's definitely going to be messy. Definitely. Definitely yeah. going to be yeah. messy, which actually, you know, I think that that's one of the things about that creative journey or the creative process is, and you were talking about, you know, refrigerator art and like wanting to have a <laughs> yeah. piece on the yeah. refrigerator wall. I know for myself that one of the biggest inhibitors to creativity is pressure and the idea yeah. to perform and the idea that it's supposed to look good, that mm -hmm. it's supposed to come out a certain way. Mm -hmm. Like how many times like just the idea of stage fright that comes up for so many people is because they're afraid they're not going to look good or they're not going to yeah. sound good or they're not going to do this. And one of the best creativity hacks that I have ever learned, and I learned this, I had this art buddy back when I was in my late 20s, early 30s, and she and I like were basically like accountability art partners. Oh, nice. And we talked to each other about making art every single day. We'd get on the phone and we'd just commit to making art every day with each other. And one of the things that she suggested, and this is like, her, her name was, is, her, you know, her name was Kate. And one of the things that Kate suggested that was just like the best suggestion ever was make lousy art. Mm. Don't try to do something good. As mm -hmm. a matter of fact, deliberately go for the absolute worst, most hideous, like disgusting like just the worst possible <laughs> schlockiest awfulest thing you could possibly do and the thing is that all of a sudden the pressure gets taken off mm -hmm. it becomes really fun yeah. and it just gets silly and then suddenly you're like oh my god that doesn't really that's not really that bad yeah because a, when you start that you let the creative channel open, you can't really make something horrible mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when you're letting the channel open. I think yeah. when you're trying to make something good, I think it actually is more likely going to come out as a piece of mediocre, like, yeah, crap, than if you actually are like, you know what, I don't care. I'm just going to have just fun. Playing. I'm, I'm playing. playing. I'm going to play. Yeah. I have something along those lines that I recommend, which is that if you have a primary, some people don't, they just dabble. But if you have a primary creative focus, like mine is writing, and you get stuck, or you're not feeling it, do do something different that's creative. Like I will play my drum or I will um, I'm not a visual artist, but I will experiment in my art journal and something in, and you're doing it not for the product. Like I'm writing a book, so I, that's my product. But if I'm going to go play my drum or I'm going to mess around in my art journal, nobody's going to see or hear that but me. That's just for fun. And that will free up. It like seems to free up some blockages inside. Well, and actually, you just said something that I think is so incredibly important, too, which is the whole concept of for fun. Yeah. You know, we yeah. are living in such, you know, I mean, the, the the harm of patriarchy and empire is that everything is about monetizing and right. how can you monetize this and how mm -hmm. can you monetize that? And, mm -hmm. you know, like, is it what are you? Well, and even as children, I mean, the message that you and I because I will it's say for the grades as children are well for, the, for grades, yeah. but also I will say that I also got a very clear message at a, from a very early age that artists starve, mm -hmm. that, you know, you can't mm -hmm. make a living doing this. I'm not really sure how I managed to get into arts, like considering the amount of social pressure 
to to like like around you can't possibly make a living Mm -hmm. as an artist i don't know how i managed to do what i've done Mm -hmm. in the sense that you know i was determined to be an artist i was determined to go to art school and i ended up i mean i had a thriving career making making good money Mm -hmm. as a visual artist tattooing for 20 years Mm -hmm. and so i mean somehow i managed to do it despite that But I think that one of the things that really, really blocks our creative process and actually ultimately blocks the flow of abundance and potentially even the monetization of it is the idea of the pressure to perform, the pressure to make it good, the pressure, the idea that it can't just be fun. Mm. And that, I think, is such an incredibly sad thing. Like even the idea that love people talking about like, oh, I'm no good at this. I can't make any, you know, I'm not yeah. a good writer. Or I'm not a good singer. Good, I'm, not I'm not a good, good enough. I'm not good, good enough. enough. Yeah, not enough. Yeah. And it's heartbreaking because it's like, I think art and creativity and self-expression through whether it's music, whether it's dance, whether it's cooking, whether it's embroidery, whether it's, you know, whether it's writing, whether it's visual art. whether it's even like sports or something, but like where we are expressing ourselves creatively, it's like, it is so tragic to me that we've lived in a culture that kind of like, it's all about grading everybody. Mm -hmm. And like, if you don't hit a certain standard, you're not allowed to do it. So I love that you're talking about this idea of just like giving ourselves permission to do the other things. Yeah. Yeah. Just just for fun. This this also points toward one of my favorite things about what I do now um, as an author and a book midwife is I gather groups of creatives. And often the people I work with aren't necessarily writers or don't consider themselves writers. They just they're creatives of some sort who have a book idea and or entrepreneurs who have a book idea. And so gathering these groups of people who clearly are creative and may not may or may not be doing that for a living, but just to talk amongst ourselves, talk with other people who get it because the muggles in the world, they they don't get it like they're not going to get it. And you can go to your day job. That's another thing we, we touched on, too, mm-hmm. is like go. you can go to your day job and you don't have to give it 110 percent. No, you can phone it in a little bit. You know, you can do good enough at work and then your creative life can be shared with others who get it, can be experienced as fun, as exploratory. And that's going to create as a byproduct, that's going to create better art. Like you were saying about doing the on purpose, messy, you know, messy draft or, you know, bad art, quote, quote. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. Well, and, you know, talking about the idea of you can phone in your work mm. is that I think that one of the things I've noticed for a lot of empaths is that we have this sense of responsibility to meet everything and every one at this level of all in Mm -hmm. and that we owe it to everybody to listen intensely. We owe it to everything to just show up in this way. And it was revelatory for me to realize, you know what, sometimes it's really okay to just go through the motions. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, as I think it was Woody Allen who said, what, 90% of life is showing up. Mm -hmm. And it Mm -hmm. took me a really long time to understand that sometimes all you got to do is show up and not pour your heart and soul into it. Because that's the other thing I think so often as empaths, we, we place value on because we pick up the thoughts, feelings, and energy and sensations of everything in the world around us. One of the things that I've noticed is that we have a really hard time triaging and prioritizing what's really important. Mm -hmm. Because if you're feeling distress coming from all these different places and you just sort of want to put those distress fires out, we will often tend to give the same amount of intensity and commitment to somebody who like locked their keys in the car Mm -hmm. to somebody who just found out that their spouse is dying of pancreatic cancer. And, and I think that there's a certain sense of like empaths pick up because we pick up on the emotional frequencies of people around us and situations around us. We will get this sense of urgency, regardless of how important it is. And it's like, if you are working, um, you know, a B job, like moving widgets and stuff like that. It's not, it's, it's like, it's not your job 
to show up and pour your heart and soul into it every single day and then come home completely drained. But I think yeah. that is well, that was what I was yeah. going to say is you, if you're giving 100 percent to everybody else, you're not going to have any energy left for your no, creative projects. Not and at then all. You're not going to move forward with them and you're going to feel frustrated and disappointed and all these things rather than say, you know what I can do? You know, I can give maybe 70 percent at work today. And then when I come home, I'm going to take a shower and I'm going to go sit down at the easel or whatever your thing is. Right. You know, right. So save, right. save some, save <laughs> some, yourself. save yeah. some. That's the, another thing uh, in talking about like a way in which being an empath helps you as a creative person. I've found that um, Julia Cameron's suggestion in the artist way of doing artist dates mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. really an awesome way of using my empathic powers to fuel my creativity. So let me explain. An artist date is just taking yourself out on a solo date. You're not working. You're not writing or whatever your thing is. You're just going out for inspiration and you're by yourself. And because you're by yourself, often in a public place, whether you go for a nature walk or I like to go to a little touristy town that's in my area that I don't usually go to because it's touristy and be a tourist in my own land, so to speak. You're going, you're sitting at a sidewalk cafe and watching people or you're going to um, a park or your whatever it is, yeah. night window yeah. shop. And you're just taking in all this stuff, but it's not personal. It's right. not your bestie saying that, you know, she, he's she's worried that her husband's cheating on her. You know, it's not like that intensity. It's it's just looking and letting it sort of float by kind of like when you're meditating and you let your thoughts float by when you're on your artist date, you're observing but you're letting it not be something you're attached to. Yes. And it's yes. so inspiring. So inspiring. And it's interesting that you say that because I was actually thinking about, you know, and this really ties into it, that one of the other things that I have found is that in order for our creativity to really flourish, there are times where we must be willing to walk away from it mm -hmm. and, and take a break. Yeah. And I really find, and actually um, Chris Ferraro, who's been inter, I've interviewed a couple times and actually she and I, just had an amazing conversation around a bunch of different things, including what it is to be a misfit, what it is to be a trailblazer, mm -hmm. all kinds of really incredible stuff. Um, but Chris and I were later, we were just talking about the fact that there is sort of like, you know, as a creator, there's also being like we are incubators and we are marinators and mm -hmm. I would say we are percolators. And what I have found is that when it comes to the creative process, stepping away for periods of time and sometimes for me, it's been upwards of a year or longer mm -hmm. with certain things, but allowing the creative process to like marinate, allowing the creative process to gestate and then coming back to it. And I think the artist states are a wonderful thing. Um, you know, I would have called it for me, it would sort of a similar thing of just like going on an adventure, yeah. like getting out, going to, you know, going and walking in nature, going to botanical gardens. Yeah. Just getting that exposure, getting the opportunity to be exposed to and stimulated and just seeing new things, art hearing museums new things, are art museums are like, perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that really is allows that creative process to kind of bubble up again. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's definitely the ebb and flow process. Whereas in this society, when we're always about productivity, right. There isn't a lot of room for that organic nature. Yeah. And and with our leisure time, too, we tend to be. So I feel like there are three things that any kind of creative, whether you're empath or not, needs. You need output time when you're actually doing mm -hmm. your thing. Mm -hmm. You need input, which is like the going to the art museum or watching a show, reading a book. And you need downtime where nothing's happening. Nothing. You're just doing complete downtime. And a lot of us are very poor at that because when there's downtime, what do we do? We pick up our phones. We get input. We want input more, put on the music, turn on the TV, input, input. Input's great, but there need to be times when it's just quiet time. Yeah, yeah. stillness. Yeah. And as empaths, the thing that I think can happen for us, like I, I mean, my husband would attest to this. I, I'm lousy at the beginning of any vacation time. <laughs> I'm lousy at it. Downtime's hard. Because <laughs> I start to feel the decompression and I start to feel blue when yeah. I go when I go into too much stillness. It's yeah. like then all of a sudden it's like the grief and the sadness and the yeah. the stuff will come up and being willing to sit with the 
you know, just being willing to sit with our own, but our own energy, being willing yeah. to sit with ourselves. I mean, some people I think are much better at sitting with themselves for longer periods of time, but like, it might be that you learn to start sitting for your sitting with yourself for a minute at a time, yeah. you know, and it's I, like meditation. So yes. people say they can't sit in meditation. And so the advice is often moving meditation. Moving. I find that's the same with downtime. If I'm, if I'm having a hard time sitting with something, um, doing something mindless like dishes or something repetitive, folding laundry. Uh, it's not always housework, but that's what's coming up at the moment. But, you know, just something just where you can move your body, but you still have emotional space to just. Yeah, your float. brain has a chance yeah. to float. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think that I realized many years ago that I don't do silent, like mindfulness meditation very well. It just it's it's not like I've got it just doesn't necessarily like if I if I'm doing trying to do silent mindfulness meditation, what often happens is monkey mind engages. Mm -hmm. And then all mm -hmm. of a sudden I'm just like, bleh, 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 bleh. Yeah. Yeah. What I have found, though, is that if I am engaging with walking or if I am especially using um, breathing and mm -hmm. doing mindful breathing and for me, tapping mm -hmm. has been this amazing tool because what it has given me is something that I can do without getting a lot of input. Yeah. And so it allows yeah. me to engage the part of my brain that just does better with something to keep it occupied mm. so that the other part of myself can kind of open up and expand into the numinous and expand into just kind of like that infinite possibility. This is a good uh, segue into something else we wanted to talk about, which is the creative process mm -hmm. and how we each have like a different sort of a creative process just to highlight like everyone's different. And yes. Pastor will will do this in different ways. So my my process is to regularly uh, take time for my creativity. Um, I write in a journal every day. I wouldn't say I, I'd say if I'm working on a book project, I, I don't necessarily work on that every day, but every day I'm doing some writing, journaling something. And I have a regular short, you know, window of creativity where all right, this is the and I have a little ritual where I'm sitting down, I have my playlist, I have my crystals, you know, I might have sometimes I have a particular candle for a certain work and I, okay, this is my container. And now I can write and, and from what we were just saying, like, sometimes that it's crap, you know, it's, yeah. like, it's, it's like Stephen King. So you just show up and write. Sometimes it'll be brilliant. Sometimes it'll be crap, doesn't matter. And so having those little windows of time, that helps me get my brain into the groove. And I think if I was faced with like, okay, it's Saturday, I'm going to write all day, I'd just run away screaming because I can't, you know, the, you know how some people like to do movie marathons, they're like, mm -hmm. oh, let's watch all the Lord of the Rings movies. That is my nightmare. I can't sit still and focus on one thing for that long. But I like having these containers where it can, you know, it keeps coming up. I know the next day, here I go again. Yeah. And yeah, if I'm in the throes of writing a book, or I'm doing National Novel Writing Month or something, it might be and it might end up being a couple hours, maybe even three, but that's, that's kind of where I max out. And then I know you're, you said you're the opposite. I'm like, the opposite. Yeah. Well, and so it's really interesting, because there are certain things where, you know, you and I were also talking about like how there are certain things that you don't even realize, like you're so immersed in it. It's like, you don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. And I realize, like, I mean, I generally tend to do visual art and create something uh, like doing graphics and things like that. And, and I actually do tend to write almost every single day. Mm -hmm. I do it more in the evening, morning pages. I am not a morning person. Mm -hmm. I am barely functioning in the morning. <laughs> I am a zombie. I have been since I came out of the womb. I have never been a morning person. No amount of waking me up. I just remembered my dad. <laughs> like my father would come up to my bedroom, throw the bedroom door open and like run around my room, like <laughs> singing to me, wakey, wakey, rise and shine in the morning, fine, bacon and eggs, breakfast. <laughs> Yeah, when you are like, and you were like, get out or uh, yeah, you you're know, like, like, you're yeah. a preteen, <laughs> yeah. and your father is running around in a towel, <laughs> yeah. singing at you, trying to get you to wake up, and he was just trying to get me out of bed, <laughs> but I was just like, go away, <laughs> go away. <laughs> so like, people who talk about morning pages, I'm like, no, no. <laughs> I can't do that. It's yeah. not me. And the thing is, instead of trying to force myself to be a morning person, I've come to terms with my 
rhythms yeah. and heat mapping my time. And that's something I think is so incredibly important is that just because Nikki and Julia Cameron do really well with morning pages or do something. You well, know, like, yeah, but my morning okay. is like nine o'clock, not like six. OK, like, yeah, six, I'm like still, no nine o'clock. No, yeah. no, I would still be a complete zombie <laughs> yeah. at nine o'clock in the morning with morning pages. <laughs> and what I realized is like, you know, these ideas of ritual that are like about containers. When I realized that for me, my morning ritual is actually my coffee, mm. my relationship mm. to like Lilu and I, or, you know, I mean, now it's Lilu before we had Bob the pug, mm -hmm. but you know, me and the pug, we get up, we go downstairs, we feed the cats, we go outside for a, a brief walk. If the, you know, mm -hmm. we do, we do our thing for a little while then, you know, and then I come back in and I brew the decaf now. Mm -hmm. And then I just have this ritual of kind of just being with the coffee and, easing my way into the day and just kind of allowing myself to just sort of be. So actually, I tend to start the day with less input and more just kind of like, okay, I'm just going to kind of sink into the day. Mm -hmm. And I'm more likely to have time for the creative projects or the creative process much later in the day. But as you were saying, you do really well with these bursts of creativity. Yeah. When I'm working on a project, I do really well with long periods of time, like carving out, like saying, OK, I'm carving out time and I'm going to work on this right now, mm -hmm. because what I find is that getting my brain engaged and shifting gears takes a great deal of energy for me. And so I need to it's sort of like I need there needs to be a certain amount of arrival time. And if I just had a half hour or an hour or even two hours, by the time I finally got there, it would be time to pack up and go home. It reminds me of like taxiing, like when you're in a plane, taxiing and then taking off mm -hmm. and, then, and then you're in the air. Yeah. And then when you, you have to descend in a certain way slowly and then come in. Yeah. And then coming like, back yeah, in. And, yeah. you know, and it's like if you were sort of imagining that, like, you know, taxiing from like Portland to New York City, mm -hmm. you know, or going, you know, like when you're mm -hmm. talking about a flight where you're up in the air for maybe 45 minutes to <laughs> yeah, an hour yeah. or two, it's really really different than when you're up in the air flying across country yeah. and you've got this chunk of time. Mm. And so for me, what I've discovered is that when I'm working on a really important or big project, I need to create, I need to really guard my calendar and I need to make time a priority, but enough time that I can dive in. And you were talking about like, you know, your playlist and you were talking about crystals yeah. and things like yeah. that. I've also found that creating ritual space for, especially for writing, mm -hmm. has been one of the most important things. And so I will put on like the binaural beats or like solfeggio frequencies. Yeah. Like I love doing 528 frequencies for like working with creativity. I'll put in so I'll put some essential oils into the diffuser and I will do things that will align my frequency with creativity, with with sort of receptivity and focus so that I can kind of sink in more easily. And I find that really, really helps. Yeah. So for yeah. listeners, it's it's a matter of experimenting, of finding your own biorhythms, of figuring out how what lengths of time you like best for working with it and just allowing yourself to experiment. I, I always talk to my new writers about, you know, you're not going to just start on day one and start writing. This is going to be an experiment. You're going to experiment with what the intention is for your writing. You're going to experiment with your writing habit and you're going to experiment with your what I call a flexible outline. Um, because, you know, anything that you plan to write about, chances are it's going to change. Chances are it's yeah. going to change. Yeah. Well, and I was thinking about something, you know, just sort of this whole conversation and how you identified as a writer and you mm -hmm. came into this lifetime as a, scler you know, as mm -hmm. a scholar, as a writer. I, on the other hand, came into this lifetime as a visual artist. Mm -hmm. I, I identified as a visual artist. And while it's interesting, I have a long line of writers in my on my father's side. Nice. I have ancestors who are published, you know, like mm -hmm. I ha I come from poets. I come from writers. I come from I come from people who've been writing. Mm -hmm. And I also come from visual artists. And but because dyslexia also runs in my family, writing was not easy. Mm -hmm. so I was 
awful at spelling as a child. I could not spell. And then one day it was the most bizarre thing. And even if I look at writing from when I was in my like teens and my twenties, my spelling was horrendous. And then it was almost like my brain matured enough that I started to have this experience where I could see words in my mind uh, and I knew how to spell things. Yeah. You were drawing the word, right? I was, you were, yeah, the, I, but I, no, I could like yeah, visualize yeah, the word. And yeah. like one thing that happens is when people, I speak to somebody and they tell me their name, I could see how they spell their name mm -hmm. in my mind, mm -hmm. but that did not happen until I was in my thirties. Mm -hmm. And I, so I had a very, very ambivalent relationship with reading and writing. I escaped into books. I loved books. I read a lot of books, but as I've, as I've gotten older and especially after having, you know, gone through undergraduate school and then graduate school and having to read and read and read, I find that my, my level of like how stressed I am, how tired I am mm -hmm. makes all the difference in the world as to whether or not I can process words. So I'm what I would call and somebody I identified primarily as a visual artist mm -hmm. and kind of ended up almost like reluctantly becoming an author. Yeah. And I'm still sometimes weird about calling myself a writer. But I mean, at this point, it's like one solo book, three multi-author <laughs> books yeah. and like another book, two other books in the works. I think like we probably three, say three yeah, yeah. yeah. actually you're right I know the about third, yeah <laughs> that you know about yeah I mean yeah. I'm probably at this point a writer but I definitely have a really interesting kind of reluctance to writing and love-hate relationship with it does your visual art follow the same pattern as your writing like do you want a big chunk of time for that if you're doing a big painting not necessarily. Ah, I can. Interesting. Well, and yeah. because I worked as a tattooer mm -hmm. for 20 years, I learned how to basically be creative on demand ah, because so I could, mm. you know, when you have when you're booking six to eight months out in advance and if you call somebody and say, hey, I'm really sorry, but I'm not in the mood to do this right now. <laughs> right. Um, you're going to have to wait another yeah. six months yeah. before I can see you. Oh, yeah. People are not going to buy that. And yeah. interestingly, there were there. I have heard stories of tattooers who are like that, yeah. where they just didn't feel Not like it, weren't it. in the yeah. mood and yeah. decided just to say, this, you know, the hell with it. But I <laughs> always saw my tattooing as a service first and a creative expression second. Mm. And so for me, I really understood that I was showing up to do something for somebody else. My motto was always putting prayers on people's skin, helping truth and beauty to surface. Mm. And I knew that it's like what I was doing was acting as a channel for their expression and their creativity and serving them in a way that they couldn't serve themselves. Right. Right. But I had to get up every single day, <laughs> drive to the studio, set up, show up, and talk with the person and produce a drawing because I would produce draw I draw while they were there because mm -hmm. I found that was a much more effective way to do it because you probably were using your empathic, empathic gifts to and tune telepathic into what they want. abilities yeah, and yeah, exactly. what I also discovered yeah. after like uh, you know because traditionally in tattooing it's very common for people to do the drawing in advance and show it to people mm -hmm. it never failed if I did the drawing in advance two things would happen either they no showed on me which uh, never happened. Uh, uh. Or they would come in and they would either go, you're really going to hate me for this, but I've That's totally exactly changed what, yeah. my, no, they'd <laughs> be like, what? but I totally oh. changed my mind <laughs> and I want something different. Yeah. <laughs> or they would be like, I'm really sorry, but could you possibly redraw that because this, 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 and this is not working. Yeah. Yeah. And so in any of these cases, I would inevitably have to redraw the entire thing. Yeah. And so I was kind of like, the hell with this. I'm just going to collaborate with them while they're standing next to me. And I can do this thing where I'm showing them the piece and we're negotiating through the process, which actually rings me or reminds me of a tarot card, which I see the three of pentacles as like the card that's all about sort of working for versus working with. Mm. And the way that I see that card is like, it's like, are you creating something and then having boss man come back to you and say, oh, no, no, you did that wrong. <laughs> right. Fix this. Or are you collaborating where it's like this creative process is happening and it's like you're getting feedback moment to moment. And what I discovered with my with the creative process with tattooing was that I could serve my clients better and I could create something much more aligned for them. Mm -hmm 
if I was drawing with them sort of hovering over my Mm -hmm. shoulder and watching the process and creating. Mm -hmm. So I learned a whole new way to create, but I also learned because it was pretty much like what I was doing to make a living Mm -hmm. that I had to be able to just show up and create on demand. Whether you had a good night's sleep or not. Whether I had a good night's sleep or not. Yeah. So you were leveraging your empathic gifts to make the art with and for these people. This reminds me of, I'm married to a musician who's an empath and his favorite thing in the world, he's a singer Mm -hmm. and so his, and a songwriter, his favorite thing in the world is to get with a group of people who are making music, group of musicians who are jamming and doing improv and to come up with lyrics on top of that, like in the moment. And they're great. Like they're, you know, like this is like, that's his, and I think it's the same thing. It's leveraging. He can feel what they're feeling as they make the music and what the listeners might be feeling as they w- are going to hear it eventually. And then he comes up with the 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 riffs and the in the That words. was exactly so, yeah. I yeah. actually when I was when I was in my early late teens, early twenties, I was actually early twenties, I was actually in a rock and roll band mm-hmm. and I was singing, and that yeah. was exactly how we worked. We yeah. were a bunch of empathic magical yeah. kids. Yeah. Um the lead guitar player was a very magical person, and I learned the process of improv and riffing and creating. They would just start playing and I would be standing in front of a microphone and I'd just start singing mm-hmm. and words would just come through me. Yes. And I yes. fell in love with the creative process that way. Yeah. I just fell in love with it, which actually even talking about the journey or how I write, the way I write is it starts by talking yeah. and then it turns yeah. into the yeah. written word. And often talking with people you've said before to me, you know, it's doing a class where yeah. there's going to be people who are, are there and, paying, you know, like giving you in, but it's like the audience. The audience. Musical. Well, yeah. and it's like, yeah. because of, it's not just the empathy, it's empathic ability. It's also the telepathic ability. Mm-hmm. I can really feel like when there is a receiver to the information, like my, like, and spirit will talk. Mm-hmm. Spirit is much more inclined to talk through me when there's an audience yes then when i'm alone yes like you know and and yeah. what is it there's I th- is it scripture but it's like when two or more are gathered in my name mm-hmm. there is something about the synergy of more than one person in space together yes for the creative channel to come through and that's what I'm finding with writers. People think about writing as a very solo activity, but actually what I'm finding, and we've flipped this, this starving artist thing and we, I call them the thriving artists. Mm-hmm. So I gather groups of thriving artists. A lot of times, like I said, they aren't even writing isn't their primary first thing, but they're creative people. And when we gather in a group and I'm the facilitator, but not the teacher, quote, quote, you know, I'm facilitating this and we have conversations. People are getting so inspired from what each other, you know, is sharing. They understand the struggle parts they uh empathize with the celebration parts they you know there's so much we can give one another even with creative disciplines that are thought of as solo right to bring that to a okay we're gonna have a two-hour zoom meeting where we're gonna you know start by talking about what we're working on and share and then do a guided meditation and now we're going to go off and work on our stuff and then we're going to come back and say how it went and what happened and where the you know the trail took us it's so enriching and it's so rewarding and i hadn't put together before today really that that's kind of an empathic Mm -hmm. uh Mm -hmm. setting but it really is because people will even say to one another oh i feel you about that i had a similar experience you know there's such empathy going on Totally. Yeah. Well, and I'm also yeah. realizing, you know, thinking back to when two or more are gathered in my name mm-hmm. that I mean, because I really believe that, you know, creativity is also about channeling the divine mm-hmm. and about magic and mm-hmm. that there is just something about our relationship when we are in syn- synergy, when we're in partnership, when we are around each other, there is just something about the amplification of that message yeah. that the signal gets boosted when we're around other people. People. Yeah. And yeah. it just makes such a huge difference. Yeah, I'll, I'll give a, you know, a guided meditation for my um, group of writers. And then uh, I have suggested that they're in a forest and some animal or being comes to them. And then we start sharing afterwards what happened. Like three people saw a deer, you know, mm-hmm. like things like that, where it's mm-hmm. like, oh, deer came through. You know, I didn't right. make it happen. It no. came through. You yeah, know, like, it came through. Yeah. And yeah. it is just so I mean, what an incredible way, you know, and just 
we're we're really mm-hmm. coming in on the end of the time here. Amazingly, this conversation just whipped on by. I was thinking about, you know, the idea of, I think in some ways, the idea of creating an isolation is actually part of sort of void energy and scarcity energy, yeah. because it's the idea of, oh my God, they might steal my intellectual property. Yeah. And whereas when we're in a world of abundance and when we're in a world of collaboration and a world of generosity, it's like, we're all cheering each other on, yeah. you know? And so it's like earlier, you know, today I was riffing and talking with Chris and we Mm -hmm. were just like jamming on her ideas for her book. And it's like, you and I are talking about this. And it's like, Mm -hmm. when we have that opportunity to support each other, it's just so much richer. It's so much more satisfying. I found that when you are first starting out, that's when you'll have those scarcity fears because you have this great idea. And what if it's the only one you ever get? But the more you tend to the wellspring of your creativity, the more ideas come. Like you were saying, oh, you have, oh, wait, I have these many books. Oh, wait, I have more ideas. More and more comes. And then you forget about the scarcity and you're like oh there's just there's I'm just in the flow. plenty there's, plenty. there's just there's plenty enough for everybody there's enough for everybody <laughs> nikki this has been an amazing conversation i can't believe we're at the top of the hour yeah. already so how do people i mean do you have any last little tidbits that you feel like sharing or um i just would love to invite anyone who's drawn to becoming part of a community of thriving artists around writing whether or not you identify as a writer to Come look me up, NikkiStarkatShields.com. NikkiStarkatShields.com, people. And the information, her Nikki's URL will be in the show notes. Nikki, thank you so much for being here today. Yes, thank, thank you so, so much welcome. for having this conversation. This was so rich. And you guys, like, just give yourself permission to make art. Give yourself permission to do the things that, you know, and whatever it for is. Fun. It might be, have fun. For fun. Have fun. <laughs> don't worry about it looking good. Don't worry about it making money. Don't worry about it. Like, don't worry about any of that. Just do the thing that is satisfying. Oh, I wanted to comment. It's sort of ironic that for me now, my creative, my primary creative adventure is like flipped and so now it's like writing has become the primary form and visual art has become the secondary kind of thing that I get to do to kind but of take a break. you get to play with it. I get to play with it. Exactly. I spent 20 years making a living on it and now I just get to do it for fun. Oh, how it's lovely. wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here, Nikki. This has just been a delight. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Mm, so good. As we come to the end of this episode, I'd love to hear what you're taking from this show. Please jump over to EmpathicMasteryShow.com to leave your comments. In the show notes, you'll find a link to grab your copy of My Empathic Safety Guide, Three Basics for Finding Calm in the Eye of the Storm. And while you're there, please subscribe and follow this show. And thank you for your help sharing this show with the people who need it. Please help me to spread the word and send this podcast to friends or family members who need support living as highly sensitive empathic people. Then join me again when the next Empathic Mastery Show airs. Okay, one last time. Hop over to EmpathicMasteryShow.com for your empathic safety guide. And until next show, shine on. We need you and your gifts here on this planet. So please don't judge your empathic rainbow by colorblind standards.